Welcome to the place where we learn about and learn from the leaders in our field who are powering human creativity. I am Aaron Dworkin, and this is Arts Engines. <laughs> Thanks again for joining me here on Arts Engines. Today's guest is Lynn Tuttle, who serves as executive director and CEO for ASTA, the American String Teachers Association. Lynn, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, and thanks for having me. Well, so, you know, I am so excited to be able to talk with you, um, especially as a violinist uh, and educator. <laughs> I have a long history with ASTA, and Sphinx ASTA was one of the very first partnering organizations uh, to Sphinx, good Lord, over 25 years ago. Wow. <laughs> um, so, uh, so it's really just just wonderful to, to talk with you and, and to talk about the mission. So, um, so first, I thought it might be good just for uh, all of our audience, if you could just give kind of the quick overview of, of ASTA and kind of what it's comprised of kind of in general uh, before we kind of delve into some more. Sure. So ASTA, the American String Teachers Association, represents string teachers, those folks who teach violin, viola, cello, bass, harp, sometimes guitar hangs out with us as well. Uh, we are a national organization with members from all 50 states, um, representing right now around 7,000 members. And our members, the va not the vast majority, the majority of them teach K-12, so think your school orcs are directors. And then we also have a healthy number of, of members who teach in the private studio space. And then, of course, we have our colleagues who teach in uh, higher education, whether they're a studio teacher in higher ed or they're helping prepare the next generation of teachers for our schools. Yeah, so and it's so wonderful because it really covers such a, a huge breadth. Yeah, from, um, you know, Suzuki folks all the way up to those teaching at Curtis and everything in between. <laughs> right, yes, awesome. So it's really a wonderful, and in some ways I just love it because it shows the breadth of instruction that takes place and, uh, Absolutely. and the of those who are who are learning in our field. Um, so we often hear about the demise of music in our public schools and all of that. And of course, when we think back to prior generations, the way that music and music education looked in most public schools was different. And many mm -hmm. students immediately got a lot of uh, opportunities that some students, especially especially today might not have. Um, so A is this, which of course I can only assume is something that ASTA thinks about. Um, and so kind of how do you think about this? Um, is there uh, a teacher shortage? Um, and, and what does ASTA see as its role in this? That's a great question. In fact, Aaron, uh, we had a board meeting last week in front of our national conference, and this was at the center of our conversation, right? So if our, we're in an, uh, an organization that begins, that has as its vision right now, universal access to string teaching and playing, um, that means we need to make certain that we've got enough teachers to be providing instruction and, for, and opportunities for students to learn and for students to learn regardless of where we can find them, right? Regardless of where they are in the nation, regardless of their zip code. Um, and so while we, as you began this question, talk about sort of the demise of music education, actually music Music ed's been relatively stable for the last 40 odd years in our nation's schools. That doesn't mean that instructional time hasn't shrunk. And that doesn't mean that there aren't students that have been left out of instruction. We can talk more about that if you want. Uh, but what that does mean is that we have programs in place what I have known in the field for the last couple of decades working in the state of Arizona and working at the national level is there's always been sort of an endemic string teacher shortage. There have never been enough string teachers. I can think of Mark Schmidt at Arizona State University calling me up when I worked at the Department of Ed saying, hey, I keep having people looking for string teachers, but I like all my kids already have jobs. Where else can we be looking for, for potential new string teachers? Um, what I've seen with the pandemic is a shift from it being sort of an endemic thing to an epidemic 
we, we are seeing people leave the profession. We're seeing young people not entering the profession. Um, and we need to think about the work that we can do along with our higher ed partners and partners like Sphinx and others in the field to um, encourage people who, are, who love music um, and who enjoy teaching to consider this as a profession. Um, and part of that might be switching that narrative, that idea that we often think about music and arts programs as having been cut because that's the narrative we hear in the press, right? Arts programs are the first to go. Well, you know what? They're often the first to be threatened, but they're threatened because school boards know that people will come out and then support the budgets and keep their programs. Maybe not as robustly as we want, but at least keep the programs, right? So we need to let parents of future string educators know that there are positions, there are jobs that you can actually be employed in this um, and have it as a career path. Um, and related to that, right now there are teacher shortages all across the nation, including 20 odd states that have music education listed as an area of teacher shortage, which means that if you go teach um, at a school at a community that is underserved and you teach music in that school, you can get your student loans forgiven. Wow. So we need to be getting, I think, some different messages out there. Um, and then I think we need to be also I wonder about how do we support people who may not come through the traditional pathway into music teaching in our public schools that might come through alternative certification. Maybe they're a teaching artist first, or maybe they're a studio teacher first, or maybe they're a performer who then understands how much they love to teach and they want to get to schools. How do we help them into the profession? And then how do we support them to make certain that they have the skills they need to be successful in the classroom? Because as, as someone who taught in a studio for many years, it's a lot different teaching one-on-one -on -one than it is with 30 beginners in the classroom in front of you. Uh, yes, no. <laughs> Absolutely, as, as many of our Sphinx teachers uh, know very well, and uh, uh, and and it, it is a challenge. But then you see that impact, and it's and it's Aww. extraordinary. So this is really, I think, um, uh, so important to know, and so great for our audience to know. Many of whom either may know teachers, and Absolutely. or who are interested in this in this career path. As as you see this kind of uh, pandemic. Uh, related to uh, a lack of, of teachers. Do you see a tie-in with the pandemic slash endemic health one? Uh, and, um, and or do you see that there will be any kind of shifts in the way mm. that string teaching takes place permanently beyond when we are fully in endemic stage um, in terms of the way that teaching takes place? And will that affect this at all? That's a great question. And I think we're still learning what that answer is going to be, right? Um, so I can imagine, first of all, nothing, at least for me personally, nothing beats the magic of teaching in person and hearing that ensemble live um, and getting to, to be connected to that music making in the space. Um, with that said, if we're looking at a long term Unfortunate. It's fortunate to say that, but I think that might be where we're headed. Long-term teacher shortage. How can we make use of the technology that you and I are using right now to place string teachers in communities where maybe there isn't currently a string teacher? Can we um, can we provide different pathways into instruction and into connection so students who want to learn have an opportunity to learn, even if it isn't the best or the uh, most most personalized learning. This can still be very personal, right? But um, it's very different for me to hear you play over this than it is for me to hear play in the room. But maybe we can mix up, maybe, uh, and maybe our, our itinerant teachers, right? Oftentimes string teachers, beginning string educators are in one, two, three, four, five different schools. Maybe by using technology, we can make their life a little easier. Maybe you're not going on site and trying to do that rotation every day. Maybe it's every other week and you're joining everyone Zoom and then you're going to, I'm making stuff up. I don't know. But I do think there's an opportunity with the technology. Um, and I also think the technology lets us maybe help our students explore a variety of music making that we haven't always found in our orchestra classroom. So how do we engage our students to be um, not only learners with us, but perhaps also teachers with us, facilitators of knowledge with the music that they like, the music that they are interested in engaging in, and how do we help, how do we open ourselves up to learning that way as well? Yeah, oh, definitely, definitely. So, you know, one of the things you had referenced too was there are, are some students who are more underserved than others or who have less access. Yep. 
um, and um, and where there, there's been more of a shift in terms of what's available to them uh, in terms of of, uh, of music and especially string uh, training in the schools. And ASTA is engaging in some really key partnerships because obviously I think mm -hmm. this is very important to you. Could you kind of share the nature of, of that work? Sure. Uh, so I'm, I'm so grateful for the partners that we've just begun to do this work with. But I, back in, I want to say August, so I'd been on the job only a couple of months, we did a town hall with ASTA members. And the main thing that members were asking for was access to uh, repertoire from underrepresented composers. They wanted new music in their classroom, but they didn't know how to find it. Um, or if they could find it, it wasn't necessarily going to fit well for an intermediate ensemble, for example. Um, and so um, talking to, um, we were talking with the uh, manager for Jesse Montgomery, and she was talking about the difficulty that composers who may be self-publishing find in terms of getting their music to classrooms, right? Because there are vendors and bureaucracies to go through with school districts. Yeah. Um, and so through all of those conversations, I was really fortunate to, uh, to bring those questions and queries to two wonderful uh, colleagues who are now partnering with us. Uh, one is Alyssa Jones at Rising Tide Music Press. So, right, Alyssa's already starting to shepherd together um, composers uh, from uh, various com communities, right, by BIPOC communities. And these are young composers, up and comers, right, folks that are in the first decade of their careers. Um, and so she's got this wonderful um, group of composers with whom we can work. And, and I reached out to her and I said, well, would they be interested in working writing, composing for string ensembles. And she said, yes. I said, would they find it helpful to work with ASTA members to help them learn how to write, right? It's one thing to write for a professional ensemble. It's another thing to write for beginners or intermediate. She said, absolutely. And then she said, you know, Lynn, that's exactly why I put Rising Tide together. I wanted to provide opportunities to learn for these composers so they can learn about these different areas of the industry, different ways in which to write for different audiences. She goes, it's perfect. So we're partnering with her. And then a uh, longtime colleague, uh, John Malinchek, who's now Vice President for Education at Hal Leonard. And Hal Leonard has a platform uh, arrangeme.com where we're going to create in essence an asta white label area where we can place uh, just compositions for string ensembles for the string community so you can go to one place find these resources and we can welcome others into the community as well right in arrangeme.com anyone can be a composer anyone can be an arranger um, and you can place your your materials forward and if you want them connected to the string community you can connect them to asta if you want them just out there for everyone you can do both so um, it's a really wonderful way to help the composers get their works out there right hal leonard and arrangeme.com is, is a vendor for every school district in the nation so we're trying to you know grease the wheels to make it easier to get forward and then support up and coming composers um, who may be interested in writing for string ensemble. Oh. Well, I love this and, and, and this work is so important. And I love is that obviously you're incorporating um, both uh, partners and obviously a clear, you know, uh, priority in terms of, of building that diversity. Absolutely. The music that's available to students, but also the very pragmatic administrative necessity of okay it's great to do that but then if students don't actually have access to it they can't get to it. to it exactly and the reality is there are these mechanisms in our field and and adding those partnerships obviously with how leonard to enable that to happen it's just i think even this that model could be used for a host of different things or issues where people see, oh, how can we really build the, uh, the breadth of diversity that exists in this aspect? And so I, I definitely love that, that approach. Um, unfortunately, we are just about out of time, but I always like to ask of our leaders, you know, you're doing this work, you're putting together complex partnerships and obviously have a breadth of, of membership to, to be responsible mm -hmm. for and, and thinking about and, 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 and responding to and strategizing for. There's gotta be some time Tough days and days when it seems like there's some insurmountable challenges. And just as a leader, I'm curious, how do you um, address those? Is there anywhere you go to for inspiration or for strength during the toughest of times as a leader? Hmm, interesting question. Um, so I think of two things. Uh, one, I, can, I can't do any of my work without doing it in collaboration, right? I mean, 
I'm trained as a musician and I'm an ensemble player from, from day one, right? I, it's always with others, it's always in partnership. And so in the toughest times, for, for me, a tough time means that I, I, I can't figure out what the vision is. I can't figure out where to go next, right? I feel stumped and stuck. And that's when I start calling calling my colleagues, calling the Lissa Jones of the world, right? Call, calling those people to say, help me get unstuck. What are you thinking about? What are you thinking forward to? And, and learning and listening, right? To, again, drawing on that skill as a musician of just listening and taking it in and then figuring out how then I can move forward or how I can help the association members move forward. Um, and then the, the other thing too, is sometimes I just stop and I go, I go find some great music to listen to. I go um, remind myself why I do what I do every day. I either go play it myself or go listen, go listen to others playing and making great music. Well, Lynn Tuttle, you truly are one of the arts engines who is powering human creativity in our world. Thank you so much for being on the show. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you.